morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening as we have participants joining us uh, from all over the world uh, for this session. Uh, our topic for today uh, session is uh, infrastructure for inclusive growth, uh, which is the government needs uh, to rebuild uh, infrastructures uh, weakened due to the previously downgraded budgets, how to ring fence uh, strategic infrastructure investments, current implementation when faced. Uh, realities of the pandemic uh, and potential mismanagement of budget, uh, how to use infrastructure uh, to encourage uh, long-term inclusive growth. Uh, this is our topic uh, for today's uh, session. Uh, we have a, a great uh, panelist uh, joining us uh, in our session uh, from USA, Nigeria, Bangladesh, and China. Uh, and i like to welcome all the speaker and panelists uh, in this session. But uh, to start the session, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, today's our, our speakers. Uh, uh, first, uh, Mr. Uh, Blessing uh, O. Uh, M. Hayer from Nigeria, uh, Managing Director uh, for Umagini Pipeline Infrastructure Limited. Uh, he is in op uh, operating in the uh, midstream of the oil and gas sector in Nigeria. He is a certified performance coach, has more than 23 years working in the corporate environment. Uh, Mr. Blessing is uh, passionate about entrepreneurship, strategy, coaching, life transformation, business startup initiative with relevant information. Uh, he's the president of Inspire Extra Empowerment Initiative, which is a non-for-profit organization focused on capacity development and leadership among youth and business executives, uh, and also the convenience of greatness possibility. Uh, he's the alumni of Harvard Business School, Blessing is also a graduate of banking and finance from the University of Benin, uh, Benin City. Uh, he also holds a master's degree in international business management and, and also in strategic planning from the Edinburgh Business School. I'd like to uh, welcome him into the panel. Uh, before I, I go into the uh, second speaker uh, introduction, I'd like to give you, Mr. Blessing, to uh, for your opening remarks, please, now. Thank you so much, Darius, and thank you. A pleasure meeting everyone, all panelists and uh, participants today. It's a pleasure being here and um, joining us to discuss the issue of infrastructure for inclusive growth. Um, looking at where I come from in Africa and zeroing down to Nigeria as well, we know that most of the issues we have is the issue of poverty. And one of the ways we can elevate the standard of people is to provide the needed infrastructure. Government cannot solve poverty problem alone, but government can create the platform where business people, individuals can leverage, you know, the infrastructure for growth. We hope that through these discussions today, we should be able to stimulate and challenge the government for um, inclusive growth and performance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 now I'd like to introduce our uh, second uh, panelist uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Bernard Padre from USA. He's a CEO and founder of Blue Like and Orange Sustainable Capital. Uh, previously, uh, he was managing director of the World Bank and uh, World Bank Group uh, Chief Financial Officer. Prior to that, he was a Group Chief Financial Officer of Society General uh, and other organizations, serve as a member of the president Ekla Chirac, a diplomatic team as his uh, deputy personal representative for Africa. He spent seven years at Lazard in New York, uh, London, and Paris as a managing director, where he co-led the restructuring of Eurotunnel. Uh, he started his career in Paris as an inspector, then deputy head uh, of the auditing service of the French Ministry of Finance. Uh, then he was uh, served as the board of Canadian FinTech Wealth Simple and he is non-executive director of uh, Gatling. Uh, Bernard also wrote books uh, on the topic, uh, Can Finance Save the World, uh, uh, prefaced by uh, Macron and Gordon Brown and translated in multiple languages. Uh, he's a regular speaker and a teacher of Georgetown, uh, John Hopkins, Princeton, and Oxford. You know, I welcome you uh, uh, in our session and I'd like to request you to share your opening remarks now, please. Well, thank, thank you. Uh, I'm based in the US, but I'm French. Uh, so <laughs> I, will repeat, I will repeat the, the obvious. Uh, I mean, it was true 10 years ago. It's even more true today. 
including in the US now, which is a very big surprise, the discussion on infrastructure in the US with the Biden infrastructure plan. I've been working on infrastructure for 20 years, and now there is a broad agreement that infrastructure is good on the demand side, it's good on the offer side, it's good on the structural reform side, and it's good on, on the fight against poverty. So one might argue that now is the time to do things, and uh, I think that post-COVID, uh, we will really move forward. There, there is money available. I mean, a year ago, nobody thought there was money left, but now everybody sees there is money everywhere. There is a big focus on ESG impact, sustainability, etc. There is an ideological consensus, uh, an ide ideological agreement that sustainability and inclusiveness is the right thing to do, even if we need to discuss inclusiveness, if we need to discuss the definition of sustainability. So I think the big issue today is no longer the money as a consensus. The issue is to make sure we have the right projects. So we need really to work and focus on that. On, on the preparation, on, on tools to foster public and private cooperation. My hope for today is that this is the last panel ever on that topic. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and now I like to introduce uh, Mr. Eric uh, Bergloff. Uh, he's the inaugural chief economist at the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Uh, uh, before uh, joining AIB, he was a director for Institute of Global Affairs uh, at LSE School of Public Policy and a chief economist of the European Bank for Re Reconstruction and Development. Uh, uh, he is also a professor, has published widely in top journals, economics on a subject economics and political transition, corporate governance, financial development, and EU reforms. He was a member of Secretariat of the G20. So I'd like to welcome you here, Mr. Eric, and I'd like to request you also to share your opening remarks, please. Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much. And, and uh, dude, infrastructure is about trying to allow people to realize their opportunities. And, and I think there are, we, we know that there have been a, a lot of illustrations of how these opportunities are not being realized uh, from the COVID uh, epi uh, pandemic and that we have seen in healthcare how uh, deep inequalities have, have uh, been uh, made transparent. We saw in digital infrastructure the lack of it really brought about uh, how, how from fundamentally unequal uh, some of these um, uh, infrastructures uh, work now. So we need to put a lot more emphasis on on uh, using infrastructure as a tool. And as Bertrand was saying, it's, it's not so much about the availability of money, it's about structuring projects, projects that really uh, help us uh, uh, produce these uh, uh, qualities of opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'd like to move to uh, USA. Uh, the next, uh, our panelist, uh, Mr. Jonathan Tower. Uh, he is the managing partner for Architress Impact Investor uh, Company, LLC, an impact investment firm currently managing its sixth fund, uh, the Opportunity Zone Fund uh, 2020. Uh, he invests in growth-oriented op operating businesses and infrastructure with heavy emphasis on underserved and underrepresented communities uh, based in Boston and found in 2000, uh, founded in 2009, uh, has partnered with the Cressage Foundation, Harvard Business School, uh, of Professor Michael Porter's initiative uh, for the competitive inner city and multiple other foundations, uh, federal and state government agency partners to make investments in opportunity zones and other under-reserved served sorry uh, areas uh, with aim of delivering market rate returns alongside the social impact uh, he's uh, over 18 years of industry experience investing in private equity and private debt uh, including three intern chief executive officer roles in a private equity backed company 
uh, he has invested and worked closely with the portfolio companies in manufacturing technology and service industry uh, prior he was a managing director operating partner and a member of investment committee at Dutch Capital he also worked at IBM where he facilitated the issuance of more than 2 billion in in term debt he was also a financial journalist in bloomberg uh, news uh, welcome mr jonathan uh, to our panel and i like to uh, request you also to please make your opening remarks Thank, thank you, uh, thank you, sir. That uh, you, you you found quite a lot of uh, historic information on me. So thank, thank you for going, going way back. But um, it, it it's a pleasure to be with this team here, focusing on these types of topics. Um, I, I've been focused on uh, addressing poverty issues for eleven years now. Over six funds, we're a social impact investment fund. Our Terrace Impact Investors looks at low income communities around the country and builds coalitions to bring about actionable change. There's never been a time like today, not during the great financial crisis, yeah, not, not in my experience, where there was so much attention between private capital, government, and philanthropy to team together and make the exceptional happen. What we have found over time is that the types of transactions that we do would never get done by a private equity firm. They would never get done by government alone, and they're generally too big or too um, aggressive for a philanthropy to do alone. So what we do is we pull together the private capital, which is our fund. We pull together the government support and then philanthropy to make exceptional things happen, like bringing broadband fiber to low-income communities that aren't on the map to get it anytime soon, or creating thousands of jobs in some of the most impoverished and most challenging cities in the United States. So that's our focus and uh, really looking forward to uh, sharing, uh, you know, sharing views on how we can uh, do, do our job better here today. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jonathan. Uh, now the, our next speaker and panelist is Mr. Rajib Samdani from Bangladesh. He's a director of Golden Harvest Group. Uh, he's a pioneer in the frozen food industry in Bangladesh uh, under his leadership. The group has grown uh, over the years and dominating the local market in the sector of IT, commodities, logistics, food processing, ice cream, frozen snacks, ready-to-eat products. Some of the most successful international joint ventures under the leadership include the joint venture with Nippon Express in Bangladesh and joint venture with the Jubilant uh, Food Works in Bangladesh, which controls the Domino's Pizza. In uh, 2019, uh, his company also signed a joint venture agreement with IFC to form a cold chain, uh, Bangladesh Limited, which won the logistic deal of the year from Council in USA. Welcome uh, uh, to uh, to our session, and I'd like to request you also to please make your opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tariq. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, very interesting panel. And uh, I'm from Bangladesh, and this year is a very special year for us because we just turned 50. And Bangladesh, actually, we got our independence in 1971. And then we moved in 1975, we moved to least uh, developed uh, country category. And Bangladesh was previously known for flood, natural disasters. People also called us bottomless basket. But in last 10 years, Bangladesh has seen a massive change the country has been growing between uh, six to eight uh, percent from year on year over a decade. And all this was possible because of the infrastructure development our country has gone through. And this year, I'm also happy to say that Bangladesh has moved to, uh, uh, to the developing uh, country. Uh, and I think our target is by 2031, Bangladesh wants to uh, move to uh, uh, middle income group country by 2041 to a developed country and targeting those Bangladesh and private sector together actually investing in the infrastructure sector. Government is also motivating the foreign investors to come. So there are a lot of exciting uh, things happening in uh, Bangladesh uh, today. 
and that is where actually you know last 10 years everything has changed uh, uh, for us and 2019 actually because of all this development and all these investments in our different sectors bangladesh also became uh, in 2019 our growth rate was highest in asia so looking forward to discussing uh, further with this very interesting panel thank you again thanks thank you thank you very much uh, lastly let me uh, uh, myself. Uh, I am uh, Tariq Amazami, the founder and CEO of a CEO club network worldwide, which is the largest uh, business networking club uh, in the world with uh, more than for more than three decades, uh, having presence in around 100 countries with CEOs and I executive members worldwide. Uh, and I am uh, managing for more than 36 years, heading a US-based international CEO club holding company, which has interest uh, in real estate, cryptocurrency, entertainment, healthcare, education, IT, other industries. Uh, I have received more than 32 international awards, including United States Presidential Medal in 1989, and also Dubai Quality Award from the uh, uh, Vice President and Prime Minister of, of uh, Dubai and UAE uh, that presented to us. Uh, lastly, I was also appointed uh, Vice Chairman for United Nations Disaster Risk Reduction, UNDRR, uh, for other region, uh, and I am also the executive director and shareholder for Hollywood Studios uh, International in uh, USA. So this is a short profile of myself, but let me just start the panel discussion uh, with all the experts we have today uh, by asking questions. Uh, uh, so I like to ask the first question with uh, Mr. Blessing. Uh, does the government appreciate the extent of the trust deficit between her? on the people they govern or lead. Uh, can you share your thoughts on Thank you um, very much. Um, I think that's a big issue um, that needs serious attention. It's like what we have is um, the government and the people without having a meeting point. The government is supposed to govern the people and for the government to govern the people effectively, there should be understanding, there should be congruence between what the government is doing and what the people expect. Unfortunately, in the Africa continent where I belong, I don't think that currently exists. I think what we have is a government that is running, thinking that they are doing what they are supposed to do or what they know best, and the people that are expecting so much from the government. So there is need for a congruence, for a meeting point. And until that meeting point starts happening, the trust deficits which currently exists will not be closed. Right now, the people don't trust the government because they don't think the government is serving them. And for the government to earn the trust of the people, they have to ask the right questions. What do the people need? How do we provide what the people need? How do we collaborate on what we cannot provide? Until that is done, there's going to be a growing trust issue between the government and the people. I see. All right. Okay. Yes, definitely. Africa is a very different market. Uh, there is a lot of things are happening. Uh, next question, I will move to uh, Mr. Bernard. Uh, the question my, to you is, are public institutions seriously open to mobilize the private sector? Well, I wish. Uh... I think there have been a lot of talk about this mobilization of private money. And I mean, I've heard that for 20 years. And I don't want to say that nothing is happening. I mean, there are things happening, but we really need to move to the next stage. Uh, we really need to make this a central focus on all per, of all public institutions. I mean, the needs are gigantic. Public institutions, whatever you think, are still pretty small and in relative size. They should concentrate their forces where they, nobody can replace them, as has been said by other speakers, uh, really helping on the preparation, mobilizing grant money, etc. Uh, but again, as I said, today we have a lot of money available in the private sector, searching for Yale, searching for ESG. So if we don't change our approach and methodology today, we will never do it. So I think it now is really the time to, to, to really shift the needle for, for real. And that's absolutely, absolutely, absolutely crucial. And uh, I mean, there are two enemies today in the system. The first is more of the same. 
So we continue post-COVID the way we did before, and that's not going to work. And the second enemy is not invented here, where people are incapable of moving to ideas brought somewhere else. So I think now we really need to, 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 to move to, to a different place. Never have been the circumstances so favorable. Never. So if we don't do it now, we have a big problem. I see. I see. All right. Okay, now we will move to uh, uh, Mr. Eric, uh, who's the chief economist in, in Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank in China. Uh, my question to you is that what role can infrastructure investment play in the recovery from the pandemic? Well, that, first of all, I think there is a, um, you know, the pandemic is not over yet. So we are, we are still living uh, very much with the pandemic. And of course, um, Infrastructure is not something you create overnight. Is that you need to require very careful preparations. We spoke earlier about the the lack of, of uh, good projects, but uh, definitely there is a lot of opportunities for infrastructure investment. Not the least in in the healthcare sector, of course, where where we have seen very uh, uh, large weaknesses. But in, in <coughs> it, it can be play a role in in creating jobs and and. Uh, and, and creating opportunities for people. But I, I would emphasize it's not a tool that you can use very easily for, um, for stimulus. You have to, it has to be good projects and, and projects that are carefully thought out to, to um, address uh, those, you know, whether it's about in inclusive growth or it's about climate uh, change and so on. So, so yes, they can play a role, but it has to be carefully thought through. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. And now I'll move from China to U.S. Uh, I will ask Mr. Jonathan, uh, who is the managing partner of Archipus Impact Investor, that my question to you is your company has created six investment funds over 11 years uh, that blend the capital from traditional investor alongside with capital from the government agencies. Uh, and we are and what are the, some of the key learning from these funds that you could be applicable to the government agencies who are looking to attract capital to fund the most important project in their community? So a very long question, so I, I expect a long answer then. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll do my best, thank you. Um, when we started in this process, we were in a financial crisis that was not quite as severe as today. It was 11 years ago, we were going through the GFC and, and clearly there were additional tools needed to address these types of systemic challenges and poverty and, and uh, social determinants of health that have crumbled, unfortunately, over the past decade. If, if there's nothing else that anybody takes away from anything I've said today, I, I think that the key point here is that you can do it too. If, if you're in the United States, you can do it. If you're in another country, you can do it. These, these um, low-income communities have developed effective strategies for attracting the right type of capital to the right types of community development projects in their communities. It's not a big win if you're in a low-income community and you pull in $20 million to put up a new E-rate hotel. That, that's not the goal here. The goal is how do you create long-standing systemic change? So what, what we've encouraged mayors and governors in the United States to consider doing is to utilize the resources that they already have. Utilize HUD funding. Utilize new markets tax credits. Utilize different government capital programs, not to provide cheap leverage, but to, to, to come in. You, you typically think about these things on the basis of a mortgage because that's just a common cookie cutter mold here. In the United States, you come up with your down payment and then uh, a bank or a government lender will provide the mortgage with some sort of guarantee around it. Think about it the other way. We're, we're really looking for government to use its newfound budgets here to do the highest at risk portion of these projects. What you would normally think of as equity, call it the last money out of a transaction. And whether that's necessary to pay for the soft costs, the permitting, the zoning, the architecture, the planning, the land acquisition, or whether that's what's needed to catalyze growth in businesses in low-income communities that'll create living wage jobs, 
government is now getting into this bottom junior equity piece since since 2010, really, the 2010 Jobs Act. And that's where real catalytic change can happen. Debt right now is not the problem. There's a lot of debt. Interest rates are low in the world. What, where government and foundations are really having impact is, is through the, the bottom of the capital structure. So four different tools that we've seen extremely effective. One is junior equity. When government or foundations can come in and provide junior equity to catalyze a company, a project, affordable housing, or an entire program that's designed to revitalize a community. The second is guarantees at the equity level. The third is low interest debt that basically is subordinated to the equity. So loans from government or foundations that get paid back in 10 plus years after a project success. And, and fourth is a buyout clause where, um, you know, we, we can agree to build a county's broadband fiber network or affordable housing or something else like that. At the end of 10 years, we agree we're not going to make much money on this. We have a capped return, but the government will take that project over te- in 10 years. So it, it's a proxy for municipal bond financing that governments can use in off-balance sheet transactions. So this is not the answers. This is not a full recipe. I, I hope that this is the start of other conversations that can lead to actionable progress in your communities. But but these are the types of tools that that really have never been available before. And um, and I want to make sure that people remember, if nothing else, from anything I've said, that you can do this in your communities too. All right. Okay. No. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, valuable information. Uh, uh, now, from US, I will move to the other side of the globe, uh, to Bangladesh, uh, and I will request uh, Mr. Rajib, uh, who is the managing director for Golden Harvest Group in Bangladesh. Uh, the question I'd like to ask you is Bangladesh being an emerging economy uh, with steady growth for last decade. Uh, how much has the government invested towards the infrastructure development? Right. So I'll just add with uh, uh, Mr. Badre what, what he mentioned about the private fund. So that is something actually Bangladesh government also focused because, you know, for a country like us, initially we were only looking at the Uh, donor agencies or the foreign countries to borrow the money. So this is where Bangladesh government actually made the first change. They have set up the public-private partnership authority in 2010. And that has actually probably changed the entire maths uh, of of this. Uh, I'm also happy to add here that, you know, right now we are working, Bangladesh government is working on a bridge called Padda Bridge, which is going to connect two sides of Bangladesh, which is over six kilometer long bridge. $3.6 $3.6 billion investment, Bangladesh is doing it from its own fund. So, of course, for other developed countries, this is something very small, but for us to do a project like this, it's huge. Bangladesh government has also set up over 100 uh, economic zones, mainly targeting the foreign investors to come where they can come, invest, operate their business independently. They have also set up uh, over 25 high-tech parks. So this is how actually government is trying to, like, you know, uh, get the investor from abroad to come and invest in uh, Bangladesh instead of uh, relying on only, like, you know, borrowed money from outside. So, so far, uh, and, and because of all these reasons are the reason of the growth of Bangladesh, the way Bangladesh is moving very fast. Thank you. I see. Yeah. Oh, I see Bangladesh, I think, in economy definitely in last uh, five to 10 years, you know, has been grown a lot. Right. And you have uh, your currency is also very, uh, very strong now. Uh, now I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Blessing. Uh, the, the question is that how can the government properly stimulate the private sector investment in and pursued for in oh we lost you oh, I, I think we lost you for a few seconds okay you want me to repeat the question uh, please yeah okay uh, how can the government properly stimulate private sector investment in pursuit for the infrastructural development in Africa? Okay, thank you so much. I think um, the speakers here today have made mention of the fact that um, what we need to do is um, 
what everybody needs to be participates, uh, participants of. Um, Jonathan mentioned that. And um, we need all to come together. But we can't do it if we don't have leadership. So it starts from the leader. And here we talk about the government leading, you know, the conversation, leading the drive for this infrastructural development inclusively. Now, and there are a few things that are missing. One of them is the fact that government have to, first of all, define what these infrastructural gaps are, right? Sit down and say, let us identify holistically what are the infrastructural gaps. And now to do that, the government also have to come to say, what do we want to achieve in terms of empowering our people, creating opportunity, enabling businesses, you know, and ensuring that the disposable income of the population is what elevated. So first of all, define and um, identify that gap. The second thing is to develop an inclusive framework. You know, how, now that we know what these gaps are, how do we meet this, you know, shortfall? You know, and, and that is one of the things that, unfortunately, um, we have a lot of policies. What we don't have is action, commitment to those policies. We also have to come to a point where we have um, continuous governance, not fragmented governance. When every new government that attained power starts afresh, as if there was never government, as if there was nothing at all on ground. And what we do with that is we waste resources. We are not able to empower the people and sustain development. We also need a situation whereby we reduce government or public dominance, you know, in terms of infrastructure, um, development. Government alone cannot do this. Right? Government has a role. Government have to identify partners with private sector, look at other organizations that can team up so that we can come. So it's a collaborative effort. Government have to do that. I will pull back a little bit and say the first thing that we need is that the government needs to be trusted. Trusted by her people, trusted by the business community, trusted by the international community. When that trust is there, you have foreign investment. People are able to come to the country, invest, because they know that there will not be poli um, policy somersaults like we currently have. So you know that the foreign exchange policy is, is intact. The people know that, oh, though we don't have it today, in the next five years, in the next 10 years, because we trust the government, together we can develop a sustainable infrastructure state. I will stop there for now, not take all the time. Yeah. Okay. No, thank you. Thank you very much for giving us the input uh, from uh, from uh, how things are happening in, in Nigeria. Uh, now, my next question to Mr. Bernard, uh, who is the Chief Executive Officer for Blue Like uh, and Orange Sustainable Capital in USA. Uh, my question to you is, is finance really or even a, a problem? No. Uh, as I said, uh, if I mean, there was a famous say in France in France in the nineteenth century, where a minister of finance said, "If you do me, if you do good politics, I will find you good money." And uh, this is still the case today. I mean, uh, again, there has never been so much money available as of today. I mean, there was already a lot a year ago, but now with the COVID, I mean, the, the taps have been open in a number of countries. Uh, people are searching for yields with very low interest rates. They are willing to do different things. There, you need to provide them as many in this panel have said with the appropriate tools, appropriate projects. You know, with my fund, I'm investing in Latin America. A, a, a financial problem per se. We have the resources. Uh, we know that there are needs. And so, as many have said today, I mean, you, you mentioned this in particular in Bangladesh and Africa and in, in the US, actually, and I'm pretty sure Eric can see that all over the continent in Asia. Uh, <clears throat> if you find the right projects, you will be able to to, fi to find money. That, that's so. That's where we should concentrate our efforts. That's really the heart. I mean, we've been discussing that for for many many years. Uh, is, my, my only concern with the U.S. So it might be good for Jonathan, but is that with the Biden plan, the U.S. will suck a lot of this money into the U.S. outside of the rest of the world. So that that might be an issue for the rest of the world. But besides that, I don't see any real issue uh, on on the finance side. 
Oh, okay. Well, thank, thank you very much. Uh, uh, now I will move to Mr. Eric, who is the Chief Economist of a Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank in China. My question to you, what is the role of private sector in meeting the infrastructure needs and what can be done in encourage more private sector investment in, in infrastructure? Yes, as, as has been said, I think it, it is not so much about getting additional finance, but there is a role for, for private sector for sure. And, and uh, there's a role for private sector in helping to structure projects to get them uh, bankable. Uh, the private sector brings in a lot of uh, skills and, and energy experience, and, and that's important. And, and they can also help you know, uh, structure uh, investments that uh, will be sustainable over time. But there are, of course, also uh, concerns about private sector involvement in some areas. For example, in healthcare, there are many issues. Uh, there are success stories, but there are also uh, many traps to, to be, be mindful of. So the private sector has a role, and, and, uh, but it's not so much about money, it's about uh, skills and experience. That's right, you know, private sector definitely have to play a very key role in their own areas, uh, but they definitely need the government support uh, and, and a good environment to do that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, now I'd like to uh, ask Mr. Jonathan, who is the uh, managing partner for Architris Impact Investment, uh, company in USA. Uh, my question is, what is it necessary to commingle public, private, and philanthropic capital into a single fund? Thank you, uh, Mr. Tariq, and, and, and thank you, Mr. Bertrand, as well. <laughs> the, um, clearly, a lot of investments can be made with private capital alone. Um, you know, there's a thriving public equity market, there's a thriving private equity market, and, and most of that capital is diverted into transactions that seek to make the highest returns with the least risk. We have a fairly efficient financial market. The, the challenge is that um, left unbridled, those forces will create a lot of wealth in very few hands and they will take away wealth from uh, people who uh, people who need it. Um, the question always becomes, how do you attract capital to say an affordable housing project that does not have a very high internal rate of return? How do you um, encourage capital investment into Native American tribal lands or inner cities or areas in the United States which have been hit with rural poverty for many decades. How do you attract capital into those places where you know, your average investor is gonna say, that's not your best trade. There are better trades out there. Just go buy Tesla stock or something like that. So how, how do you do that? And, and really the, the solution is bringing together the forces. Um, what does a charitable foundation get out of participating in the revitalization of a U.S. inner city. Well, one, the foundation's charitable mission is probably tied to that objective. How could we create higher quality jobs for people of color in the United States? How can we uh, encourage employers to give better health benefits and pay better wages to their employees? So when you think about these kinds of challenges, um, you, you need a non-economic actor in there. So with foundations, the reason foundations work with groups like ours is they want to tr attract more private capital on top of their philanthropic capital to U.S. cities or counties or states. We just partnered with the uh, Richard King Mellon Foundation to do a revitalization initiative for greater Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh was a big U.S. steel town. It's not dependent on steel anymore and there, there's high unemployment and we're addressing some of the systemic poverty issues there. The foundation put in 20% of the capital, we put in 80% of the capital. And even though we were 80% relative to their 20%, their 20% was more important than our 80% because the foundation agreed to be the last money out of the fund. The fund makes returns, pays out the private investors first, and then there's that 20% buffer at the end. So the, we call this blended financing in, in the world of impact investing, blended financing where you're pulling together private capital, public capital, and ph philanthropy 
all into one unit. It just allows you to do certain things that you couldn't do otherwise. Think of a stool. You've got three legs for a reason. Each one of them depends on the other ones. You take one leg out, it doesn't work as well. But if you can balance that stool with public, private, and philanthropy together, exceptional things can happen. Right. right. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now my question next, Mr. Rajiv, uh, my question to you that in terms of Bangladesh story, how much of it has been a success from it has been promised by the government in terms of infrastructure? Right. I'll be very quick. I don't think we have enough time. So uh, right. yeah. basically one of the uh, success story of Bangladesh is the our energy sector. Just to give you an example, in 2009, only 40% of the population were under the coverage of electricity. Today, it is almost 100%. Another amazing case is our education. Every year, over half a million graduates are coming out. And our literacy rate is now about 73%, which is much higher